FBI report. The investigation into allegations against Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh is done. We take a look at the next steps in the confirmation process. Synod on Youth. We go to the Vatican, where bishops from all over the world are meeting. What young people taking part are saying. Catholic in America. Exclusive information from our EWTN News Nightly poll about the faithful and their views on the handling of the sex abuse crisis, plus reaction to the crisis from policy expert Arthur Brooks. And ready for takeoff, a priest in England is given a once-in-a-lifetime birthday gift. On EWTN News Nightly for Thursday, October 4th, 2018. Good evening from Washington, D.C., and thank you for joining us for News from a Catholic Perspective. I'm Wyatt Goolsby, in for Lauren Ashburn. A partisan fight breaks out after a confidential FBI report is delivered to senators. The agency investigated allegations Brett Kavanaugh sexually abused women three decades ago. Correspondent Jason Calvey reports from the Capitol ahead of a key vote. Jason? Wyatt, a few senators control the prospects of Brett Kavanaugh making it onto the Supreme Court. Senators right now are taking turns in a secure room to read the FBI findings. Christine Blasey Ford claims Kavanaugh assaulted her back in 1982. Now, today, it's a high-stakes partisan showdown. Senators react today to the confidential FBI report. They corroborated Judge Kavanaugh's uh, uh, reiteration of the facts not the people who are alleging these other incidences. There's virtually nothing new. The witnesses who were interviewed, most of them had already made statements, and they stood by those statements. Democrats accused the White House of slapping crippling constraints on the probe. The FBI did not interview Brett Kavanaugh, nor did the FBI interview Dr. Blasey Ford. What we've heard from numerous people over the last few days seeking to provide information to the FBI. The whole thing is a sham. Five days to do the investigation. Many witnesses are coming out. Republicans cling to a razor thin majority. Four senators, including three Republicans, are still publicly undeclared. Tomorrow, the Senate will hold a test vote on Kavanaugh's fate. Republicans say the investigation found no hint of misconduct, but protesters are making sure their voices are heard. The Capitol today is tense, with an unusual police presence guarding senators. You've humiliated this guy enough, and they said, you know, bottom for some of you. So, uh, so why don't we document water and see if he floats? Now, many conservatives hope Kavanaugh will be a key voice on the court when it comes to the issue of abortion. Judge Kavanaugh needs 51 votes to be confirmed. A final confirmation vote could come as early as Saturday. Wyatt? Well, Jason, will Judge Kavanaugh make it through tomorrow's critical vote? We're still waiting to see. Heidi Heitkamp, a Democrat from North Dakota, says she'll vote no. She was one of the undecided senators. Now, another key vote we're watching is Susan Collins, Republican from Maine. She called the FBI's investigation very thorough. Capitol Hill correspondent Jason Calvey reporting. Thanks, Jason. The president says even if the FBI carried out 100 investigations, it would still not be good enough for Democrats. White House correspondent Mark Irons reports. Good evening, Mark. Good evening, Wyatt. The White House believes this investigation is more than complete and is eager for the Senate to vote on President Trump's nominee. Press Secretary Sarah Sanders tells me there's nothing new in the FBI report and confidence is in Judge Kavanaugh is still high. Is the president, the president convinced he has the judge? votes for confirmation at this point? We certainly hope so. We feel, um, as Chairman Grassley said a few minutes ago, we didn't learn anything new. And based on what we knew before, we felt very confident. The press secretary this morning pushing back against reports the latest FBI investigation into Judge Kavanaugh allegations was restricted by the White House. We allowed the FBI to do exactly what they do best. We haven't micromanaged this process. We accommodated all of the Senate's requests. President Trump added on Twitter, this is now the seventh time the FBI has investigated Judge Kavanaugh. If we made it 100, it would still not be good enough for the obstructionist Democrats. White House Deputy Spokesperson Raj Shaw says the vetting process has been historic. It's important to note that over the last several months, you've seen the most comprehensive investigation into a Supreme Court nominee in the history of this country. The possibility of overturning Supreme Court decisions like Roe versus Wade 
has fueled support from conservatives for Judge Kavanaugh. It has also provoked criticism from Democrats. But I think for anyone who believes there's such a thing as a judicial temperament and that we want judges, particularly those on our highest court, to approach issues, approach plaintiffs and defendants with um, a sense of fairness, that there's a lot to be concerned about. The president says Judge Kavanaugh has been treated harshly and unfairly by Democrats, and he claims it will have what he calls an incredible upward impact on voters. In a tweet today, he said the people get it far better than the politicians. Wyatt. White House correspondent Mark Irons reporting. Thanks, Mark. At least seven Turkish soldiers are killed in a bombing blamed on Kurdish rebels. The blast occurred in the southeastern part of the country. Insurgents detonated a roadside explosive that also injured two other soldiers. Turkish President Erdogan condemned the attack, saying, quote, the blood of our martyrs will be avenged. The Kurds have waged a three decades long insurgency in Turkey. A cardinal in Chile appears before a prosecutor in the country's clergy abuse investigation, but Cardinal Ricardo Izati declined to testify as a defendant over allegations he covered up years of misconduct. His lawyer says the cardinal wants to hold the discussions in public for the sake of transparency. A Catholic bishop in Sudan says the civil war in neighboring South Sudan is affecting the church in his country. A Vatican news agency quotes him saying there is a great emptiness in the church in Sudan because of a shortage of priests and teachers to help the faithful and tens of thousands of refugees. As bishops from around the globe gather at the Vatican, we're hearing from young people taking part in the meeting. I would like to use three key words to describe about it. First, enthusiastic. Second, dedicated. And the last one is inspiring. Joseph appeared as a at a press conference today with other participants in the Synod. 36 young people are invited in the month-long meeting. It brings together 266 priests, bishops, and cardinals to discuss how the church can reach young people. Vatican correspondent Juliet Lindley joins us from Rome. Juliet, we just heard briefly from one of the young people participating in the Senate. He sounds hopeful. That's right, Wyatt. Joseph is 21 and he's from Vietnam. And today he told journalists that he was honored to be here and grateful to God for this opportunity to share young people's expectations about the, what they want from the church. Wyatt, he's been involved in preparations for this synod since April of last year. And Joseph emphasized this was a moment of great reflection. He also said young people are struggling to find their passion in life and are often living with the wrong passions. And Joseph says he's inspired that church leaders are discussing young people and the need to reach them. Over 200 bishops, cardinals, and priests are at this meeting. How does it work on a practical level? Well, there are different sessions every day, and during each session, participants are given four minutes to address the synod, no more. And after every five talks, the entire group gets a few minutes to reflect. So this morning, 25 people spoke, and later in the day, there's time set aside for discussion and comments, and during that part, each person is given three minutes to talk. So the meeting is run very efficiently. It's very structured in order to give everyone time to share their views and to comment and also to reflect. Tomorrow's small group discussions will be beginning, Wyatt. Okay, Juliet. So this is day two of the Senate. What are participants saying so far? Well, one issue the bishops are looking at is giving pastoral care to gay Catholics. My sources are telling me that today a leading American archbishop made it very clear in his speech that there is no such thing as a LGBTQ Catholic, in his view. Another topic that came up, Wyatt, is the sex abuse crisis in the church. An archbishop from Australia asked for forgiveness for the scandal that has been rocking his country, and another American bishop brought up the topic of evangelization through the media. He emphasized the importance of presenting the beauty of truth to attract the younger generation. So each participant has points to make, and the Pope is there listening and taking notes, Wyatt. So many critical issues he's having to sift through. Juliet Lindley, EWTN News Nightly Vatican Correspondent. Thanks so much. Thank you, Wyatt. Pope Francis took a little time away from the Synod this week to help the victims of earth the earthquake and tsunami in Indonesia. The Holy Father donated $100,000 towards rescue efforts there. Several Catholic groups are helping to provide humanitarian relief on the ground. 
More than 1,400 people died late last month following the 7.5 magnitude quake and tsunami that followed. For more on this story, including a closer look at what the faithful are doing to help in Indonesia, visit our partners at catholicnewsagency.com. There's a lot more on the newscast tonight. Coming up, we examine the U.S. Bishop's response to the clergy abuse crisis. Welcome back. I'm Wyatt Goolsby. We're getting a look at what Catholics are thinking on a wide range of topics. Here's Lauren Ashburn with that report and analysis from a top policy expert. Tonight, we continue our Catholic in America series you'll see only on EWTN News Nightly. In our exclusive poll conducted by McLaughlin and Associates, we ask Catholics about their views of the Catholic Church and American politics. Tonight's segment looks at how U.S. bishops have handled allegations of clergy sexual abuse. And it's not good news for them. In a poll of 1,000 Catholics taken last week, we asked how the Pope, bishops, and local church have handled allegations. More than half, 56%, said bishops have done a fair or poor job. 33% said they've done an excellent job. In contrast, Pope Francis, local diocese, and local priests are given higher marks. Let's break it down. For Pope Francis, 53% say excellent, 37% say fair or poor. At the local diocese level, 43% say excellent, 38% say fair or poor. And for local priests, excellent is 49% and fair or poor is 31%, meaning Pope Francis receives the highest marks for excellence in handling the sexual abuse crisis. And the sector that takes the biggest hit for the crisis, U.S. bishops. Our next guest has a message for them. Joining me now from Washington, D.C. is Arthur Brooks, president of the American Enterprise Institute and a respected voice on Catholic issues. Arthur, welcome back to the program. Great to be with you. Thank you for having me. You've written about the betrayal and anger felt by the laity over these church scandals. And you say, quote, the bishops should open themselves sincerely to confrontation. What needs to happen to repair this relationship? Well, thanks for asking. You know, one of the things that we all learn when we're doing marriage prep, when we're getting ready to get married, is that we shouldn't shy away when we love somebody from anger. Anger is an attempt to, to, to heal a relationship, to say something is not right. Well, there's a, an almost a marital relationship between the clergy and the laity, and, and there's anger from the laity, there's suspicion, there's a, a sense of betrayal that's coming in, and so shying away from it or, or, or simply trying to, to bat away the anger of the laity to change the subject is really dangerous, just like it would be with a married couple. Well, the reason you... for that is, according to social psychologists, that when you don't confront anger, that it tends to be it, it, disgust enters, and that can ruin a relationship. You know, you in this same piece in the New York Times compare the betrayal by Catholic clergy to a spouse committing adultery, and you received a lot of criticism for this. Why do you think that analogy works? I think it works because there's, there must and should be love and trust between the clergy and the laity. It's a sacred relationship. We are there. They're not just our pastors. They're the ones who are you know, helping us to, to, to be redeemed every day. And, you know, this is something that spouses are supposed to do for each other as well. And when trust is destroyed, that's what leads uh, the other spouse away. And so confronting this relationship and the anger that exists and the suspicion and confronting it sincerely is the most important thing that can happen right now. You often speak about the need for civility in our public discourse. How can we as Catholics have the frank discussions needed for church reform and maintain our civility? Well, part of the thing that we need to remember is that a Catholic, as Catholics, there's never any call for us to treat anybody as our enemy. We have no enemies. We should treat no one with contempt because Christians are not supposed to treat other people with disgust and contempt. We have a call to treat everybody with love, and in so doing, we, that we can exercise our apostolate. Even when we disagree with somebody, by the way, I'm not saying we need to agree with somebody who we think is incorrect, but disagreeing with love is, is really the Catholic difference. That's how we bring persuadable people toward us. We make ourselves more winsome how we exercise our apostolate, even in spite of disagreeing with other people. It's an we, opportunity. We've been reporting on the synod underway in Rome, and the church is grappling with this sex abuse 
scandal from around the world, but the focus of the meeting is on young people. You converted to Catholicism when you were a teenager. So right. how do you think the church right. needs to convince young people to invest in their faith? The most important thing is to have people understand that the church is paying attention to the problems that young people are facing in, a, in an orthodox and a very, yet very sincere way, to not shy away from the forces that are driving people away from, from organized religion in general. Uh, I mean, there's so many young people today who say that they're, they're spiritual but not religious, which is a real problem for the church, because the church as a religion is the, the greatest institution in the history of the world. And to say all of the reasons that this will bring people to greater happiness in spite of all the forces that drive them away from it in the modern world today. Before we let you go, you've announced you're stepping down as president of AEI next summer and returning to academia, this time at Harvard. As you help mold the next generation of leaders, what message do you hope resonates with them the most? Well, young leaders today have to understand that we, they have an opportunity to change the discourse in a fundamental way, that they can bring people together, not through mushy agreement, and certainly not through treating other people with contempt, but we need a new generation of people to understand that it's warm-heartedness and even love for others that, that truly will bring the country together with a competition of ideas. That's what I'm going to try to bring. I think that's the secret to aspirational and visionary leadership. That's what we need for the church, that what we need for the, for the nation, and what we need for the world. Arthur Brooks, president of the American Enterprise Institute, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Lauren. Great to be with you. Our thanks to Lauren Ashburn and Arthur Brooks. The state of Missouri is down to one abortion clinic. The license of the only other center expired Tuesday. It could not be renewed because it did not meet a new state law requiring doctors at abortion clinics to have admitting privileges at a nearby hospital. Tonight on EWTN Pro-Life Weekly, South Carolina Senator Lindsey Graham describes why he gave a passionate defense of Supreme Court nominee Judge Brett Kavanaugh. What broke the dam was when he was being asked by a Democratic Senator, Judge Kavanaugh, turned a dime again to the White House counsel and um, asked him to continue the FBI investigation if you're truly innocent. Hmm. In other words, telling this guy, if you're really innocent, you'll want this debacle to go forward, more time to destroy you and your family. That was just you can see Catherine Hedro's interview tonight at 10 p.m. Eastern on EWTN. There's plenty more to come after the break. Up next, we hear about a new degree aimed at preventing child sexual abuse and a Catholic priest in England receives a birthday gift that turns his world upside down. German Chancellor Angela Merkel tours the Holocaust Memorial in Jerusalem. She's on a two-day visit to Israel. Merkel is highlighting the close bond between the countries seven decades after six million Jews were killed by the Nazis. Welcome back, I'm Wyatt Goolsby, in for Lauren Ashburn. Back in the United States, a Holocaust survivor who became a U.S. Army Green Beret has died. Major General Sidney Shacknow was 83. Born in Lithuania, he survived a concentration camp and went on to fight in the Vietnam War. Shacknow also led American troops in Berlin during the fall of the Berlin Wall. A Vatican University is launching a new program to combat sex abuse in the Catholic Church. The two-year master's degree is offered at the Center for Child Protection at the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome. The courses include rigorous training designed for child protection officers wherever they may be serving the church. Joining us now is Professor Elizabeth Letourneau, director of the Moore Center for the Prevention of Child Sexual Abuse at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. She's working with the Pontifical Gregorian University, which is offering the master's degree. Elizabeth, welcome. Tell us about the program and how you're working with the church to protect children. Um, thanks. I am delighted to be here. And we are going to be launching, I shouldn't say we, the, the Pontifical University Gregorian is going to launch a new program uh, that focuses on child safeguarding. There's a celebration tomorrow and the day after, and I'm going to have an opportunity to say a few words. I'm not part of that program. I don't teach it, and I did not help develop it. But that kind of educational program where we're teaching young professionals, emerging professionals, about child sexual abuse and how to prevent it, identify it, and intervene around it is absolutely essential to moving us toward um, a world without child sexual abuse. 
The church is dealing with new revelations of abuse and cover-up in the U.S., Chile, Germany, and elsewhere. The church is not the only institution that has to deal with this problem. Public schools in America have had to address the issue as well as other faith communities. Uh, as an expert, what advice can you offer the church as it looks for solutions on this? I would really like to see the church um, take a leadership role in the prevention of child sexual abuse. The church has taken meaningful steps to reduce child sexual abuse, as have other institutions. Um, unfortunately, we still mostly come after child sexual abuse from an after-the-fact perspective. We wait for harm to occur, and then we intervene. And while that is very important, that means that children still have to get hurt. And I think there is a leadership role for the church to play in really promoting the primary prevention of child sexual abuse. Child sexual abuse, of course, affects over 200 million children worldwide. The World Health Organization identifies it as a leading preventable contributor to death and disability. What can regular folks at home do to protect kids and fight this more widespread problem? I think what we need is for everyone to recognize that while we all have a role to play, we really need government resources driving the prevention science. We take a preventive public health approach to child physical abuse, child bullying, adolescent suicide, peer-on-peer uh, -peer violence, but we continue to treat child sexual abuse as if it's just a criminal justice problem. It is a preventable public health problem. Fathers Ulner and I and our colleagues are working to try to promote more of a prevention mindset, So that, again, so we can have a world free from child sexual abuse and not just focusing on this issue after it already happens. Well, it's fascinating to hear about some of the research and such an important issue and communication on all levels here seems to be key. Professor Elizabeth Letourneau, director of the Moore Center for the Prevention of Child Sexual Abuse at John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Thanks so much for talking with us. It was my pleasure. And finally tonight, a group of parishioners in England pool their money to buy a birthday gift for their Catholic priest. You could say their generosity had him soaring. Father Chris Engel of Brighton is a former Royal Air Force pilot. Last month he was given a flight in a World War II era Spitfire plane. Father Chris called it a once in a lifetime opportunity and says he's very moved by the kindness of his parishioners. And by the way, Father Chris turns 72 years old tomorrow, so happy birthday to him from across the pond. And that wraps up our newscast for tonight. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Wyatt Goolsby. We'll be back tomorrow with more news from a Catholic perspective. Good night and God bless.